Well, a very good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome back to the Royal Court Theatre for the next of our Cunard Insights Lectures. We've already seen several fascinating presentations from John Hucknall about his time living and working in Papua New Guinea. This afternoon is the first of two presentations from his wife talking about her experiences in Papua New Guinea. So please give a very warm welcome to Morag Hucknall. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for coming along. And I will stay planted right here for two reasons. Once the one, because the camera's on me, and that's what happens on the television in the cabins. Uh, but just to stay stable, because otherwise I might stand doing a Highland dance across the middle of the floor. Generally, I do walk around in the middle, and I'm, I, I use my arms a lot. So bear with me if I'm standing here waving at you. Now, hopefully, you were able to... Uh, you were able to attend John's presentations. But just a little bit of background. We, uh, we met in the UK. We were in London Airport working together. And that was at 18 years of age. So we met, and for the cut the, the story short, we met, we married, and we emigrated. And basically moved from Scotland to London, London to Melbourne. And then when we got to Melbourne, John decided that ANSET wasn't the place for him. And there was not enough... Uh, promotional opportunities and he applied for a job to be a patrol officer in Papua New Guinea. Now we're 21 years of age, we had no idea where Papua New Guinea was, let alone some of the areas within Australia. So this was our first cruise, I don't know how many of you know the uh, Fair Sky, it's a very early 1970s cruise and uh, the sleeping conditions were a little bit different. The <laughs> And, and sometimes we end up like that when we're speaking on some of the ships, but uh, that shows you how tight it was. We were fortunate to have a cabin to ourselves because when you're a 10 pound palm, you tend to get split up amongst you know, men in one lot of cabins and the women in the other. But we both worked at uh, Essendon Airport for a while when we got there. And then, you know, when John got this job in Papua New Guinea to work for the Australian government to administer, you know, the law, agriculture, economic development, looking into health and community development areas within Papua New Guinea, we really didn't know what was going to happen to us. And so at 21, there we are. <laughs> that's, that's my pet. I'll tell you about him a little bit further down. He's not alive there, thank goodness. But uh, it, we started, I started my life as a wife of a patrol officer, a Kiap, and John explained all about that in his, his past presentations. He has many, many more presentations, but we don't have enough sea days and enough time on this ship to present them all to you, which is a bit unfortunate because you would hear a lot about the customs and the, the cultures and the dance and the feathers and everything of Papua New Guinea, which is really quite amazing. So I had to take on some work challenges um, when I was 21 and some new skills. And one of them um, was getting on this, this was our second cruise. It was a little government workboat that went from Ma Madang. We were posted from Port Mosby. John stayed in Port Mosby for a month when he first finished his course in Sydney. I stayed in Sydney till he was allocated where we were being posted to. I then flew into Port Mosby and moved straight away up to Madang. When we got to Madang, the um, assistant district commissioner said to us, OK, well, in the morning, go down to the wharf. You're going to get on a ship and you're going to sail up to a, your first post, which is Bogia. And the thing was, we were used to ships the size of the fair sky. And so we turned up at the wharf and we walked to the edge of the wharf and we looked around and we couldn't see the ship. And then we had to walk over and look down. And there it was, down in there. And this was the ship that we, it was a little tiny boat. And there was two cabins. And in the other cabin was actually Michael Samari, who became the chief minister for Papua New Guinea. So he was, we were told not to speak to him, otherwise he'd, he'd bite our heads off. But we jumped on it, we did as we were told, and headed up to our first posting. And you can see Bogia up there on the top, and Cider is our second posting, Madang in the middle. So we got into Madang, we got on that boat, we headed up to Bogia. And that was about 185 kilometers north of Madang. And off we, off we headed, not knowing what we were going to be doing. This is a tropical paradise. It was a small outstation at the time. It had about 10, 12 expatriate couples living there, all from sort of Australia. The coral went right around the beachfront there. We had beautiful coral, we had beautiful beaches, hills and mountains behind us, and 12 families living in houses in this outstation. And the types of houses, because my presentation is going to be about what I did, what our living conditions were like, 
when John was off on patrol for 15 to 70 days, you know, he was away straight away as well. When we first arrived in Bulgaria, our wedding presents arrived in their crates and trunks, and he then took off to go on patrol, and I was left to unpack them and sort the house out. The types of houses were very standard. That's a new one, a new government house at the end of the outstation. Now, the four-inch pipes that it's standing on is for flexibility for the earthquakes, so that the whole house would move with you, as, as the, and we're called gurias up there, so the, thing, the whole thing would move. Now, I had never experienced earthquakes before. A lot of rumblings in Scotland, but they weren't earthquakes. But we got into the, this house, and we felt it moving, and we thought, oh, that's interesting. We didn't quite know what it was, but you could hear the glasses clacking in the cupboards and what have you. Now, the walls didn't necessarily go all the way up to the roof and the ceilings. There were spaces for ventilation, because we had no, um, no el well, limited electricity. We'd have a couple of hours in the morning and two or three or four hours, if you were lucky, in the evening. So we had the, the fan you see there is a st standard fan. We'd put that on when the electricity was on, and that was run by a generator. It wasn't like powered from any main power plant. It was a generator fooled with diesel, and you would get your, your power would go until the diesel ran out or the power broke, you know, the actual generator broke down and then you would have to just sit there in the dark or without the fans. We had louver windows, which were very common in those houses. The furniture that you see, in fact, on the left photograph there is my record player I got for my 21st, an old radio that we brought with us, and there was, the furniture was provided by the government. It wasn't covered in any way, so I soon learned to sew very quickly. And on the right-hand picture, that's my expertise in making cushion covers, and curtains, bed covers, and things that I had to learn to do myself. The fridges and freezers were generally kerosene, so you had to make sure you had plenty of kerosene and clamber around and fill up those. There was no television. I got asked the other day what uh, TV programs did I watch. We had no TV at all, and the only radio station was um, the ABC Radio National. And for all the Australians in the audience, you probably remember Blue Hills, right? Well, that was a very popular radio program. It's a bit like watching uh, EastEnders or you know, Coronation Street, so Blue Hills was a similar sort of thing on the radio. So I would listen to that twice a day. It was really exciting. It took forever to go from one episode to the other. I think we were on the 5,000th episode or something. But that was the way we, we sort of entertained ourselves. I'll fill in more about that as we go through. This was our opposite our house was the Bogia Hospital. John mentioned the other day about going to the hospital with the guy who had been um, bitten by a snake. Well, that was the hospital that was opposite our, our house. Now, it wasn't anything flash, and there was only a couple of doctors or nurses there, so we never really got sick. You couldn't afford to get sick, because there wasn't anyone to really look after you. And we'd have to make our way into the main center, which was Medang for us. So once we got there, John got himself set up. That's him with these little trusty houseboy, as we called them back then. Now, this young houseboy, it was, <laughs> We didn't really need anyone to help clean the house and make the beds and do all of that because I had nothing to do. I had no job at the time, but you were expected to take on staff because they would earn some money. So you would pay them some money and you would work with them. Now, I couldn't speak very much Pigeon English. I had gone to the classes at Asopa in Sydney where John was training and learned the basic Pigeon English. He didn't speak any English. I didn't speak much Pigeon, but we got on, we practiced it together and he did everything in the house, so therefore I had to go off and find myself a job, and I'll fill you in on that in a second. But on the, the outstation, there was one family with two daughters, and they actually um, homeschooled these girls. So we decided that they would take us on our first venture into a local village. And of course, you could drive a little bit on some of the roads on the coast, on the coral roads, but most of the time you were walking or you were in a canoe. And this was us heading out in the, the vehicle, having a cup of tea. Then we were in the canoe for a couple of hours, and that's what we paddled on. And you had to really be careful, because I think there was a few crocodiles and what have you in the, the river. And then we would walk you know, three or four hours to get to the village we were going to. And it was to experience a Sing Sing, and something I had no idea about. We, we went there, and we experienced these headdresses being made and the women dancing. And unfortunately, John has another presentation on vibrant traditions which show you all the Bird of Paradise feathers and all the wigs and everything that we, we saw in Papua New Guinea. But this will give you an idea of one of the headdresses that we saw. Now, it's 
20 foot high and it's made up of, there's cockatoo feathers, there's um, lorikeet feathers, chicken feathers, any, any type of feather that they could get hold of. They just kept building it up. And it actually goes on the back of a, a young man there. And another one was up the top holding it till the guy got it on. And then he was jumping over these women, which was part of the ceremony. It was part of the, the Sing Sing. So it was a ceremony they were having. And, and it was fascinating. And some of those in that village, I was allowed into one of the old men's houses to listen to them playing their flutes, which you very, very rarely get to do. But as I was a, an expatriate, I wasn't a local woman. I was allowed in to listen to the men's business. So I was feeling quite plush, plush about that. Now, the, on the way, we had to sort of visit a bush toilet. Now, if you come back on the Elizabeth... Queen Elizabeth next year, I think it's going into Kirowina, you would, you would find bush toilets, very, very you know, comfortable sort of toilets. That's because the patrol officers of the day were given instructions to the local people for health and safety, health and safety reasons that when they're building a latrine in the, the dirt, they needed to, to dig 20 feet down, 20 feet down into the ground because that's, the flies don't go down that far. So they were given a 20-foot um, bamboo pole, and they were told, right, dig down and measure the pole, and when it, I'm tempted to go out here, when it goes down into the dirt, right down, that's it, that's where you build the, make the hole for the toilet, and you'll be fine. Now, these guys, it was on the coast, there was a lot of coral in there, and they were digging away, and they hit rock. They hit the coral rock, and they couldn't go any further. And they thought, no, oh, we better do what the patrol officer tells us. So the next time people went to one of the villages, the toilet was 20 foot off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> they'd, they'd sort of hit the ground and then thought, oh, well, 20 foot up, we'll take it and we'll build it up. So you had a huge set of stairs <laughs> to get into the toilet. Luckily, that wasn't one of them, but it was, that gave me the, the memory of that, that story. So it was really for hygiene because we had to teach them hygiene and health and welfare and all of that sort of thing. Now, in Bogia, there was an office, and a lot of the offices around the countryside were very similar, where the, the patrol officers worked, and some of the w wives would get jobs there. So I toddled off down there because I had nothing else to do, and I said, have you got a job for me? And they said, yes, can you operate a radio? I said, yeah, I know how to switch it on and off. I know how to switch a radio on and off. I'm not a problem. But it was actually the radio scared. It was for communications. And what they wanted you to do was to make contact with Madang twice a day for 10 minutes, and ring through any messages that the officers had to send through and receive any telegrams and what have you back from the people in Madang. But you also had to place all the orders for the shopping for all of the expatriate women on the outstation. So I'd be sitting there with you know, 12, 10 or 12 shopping lists, and I'd have to ring up the chemist, the groceries, Burns Phillips, steamships, some of those companies that are based in Madang, put through the orders, and then those things would be sent out. If there were fresh things, they'd be coming by plane, otherwise they'd come out on the ship. And the orders could be heard. The radio skates were heard by all of the outstations around Madang. So as they were hearing what was coming from one, you might suddenly go, oh, I remember that. I've got to put that to my shopping list. So they'd cut in and say, add another box of this or another packet of that. And the poor people in Madang were thinking, oh, wow, where's that coming from? But we had fun. We had fun. There is a radio call, but I won't make it at the moment, because with my accent, it went over really well, being Scottish. But it did call in all of the outstations that had to, to sort of go through the sked during the day. So that was twice a day, so that gave me something to do. Um, I think John mentioned Manum Island. He was the local government officer over there, and he went on to Manum. That's how close it was to where we lived. So there were other jobs that I took on, administration and secretarial bank services, postal services, I did all of those. There was other women doing them too. We took turns so that we had something to do. But we'd often go across to Manum, and Manum had the Volcanological Observatory up on the hill. And we'd clamber out there to go and check the, the actual activity of the volcano, part of our role. And on the way, we'd stop for a picnic, and then we'd go and stay in the actual building because it was air-conditioned. It was the only building in the area that was air-conditioned. So we'd go and stay there overnight. It was always a bit of a plus for us. But the difficulty was that it was also full of little things that ran around. So when you're lying in the bed, you would feel things moving around you 
tended to be rats, I must admit. There was rats coming and going all day long. So if you left some food over there, they would, they'd go on the other side of the, the bed. <laughs> it was a bit of fun, a bit of diff different. But the volcano was really interesting. It was wonderful to watch the seismic charts that were there. I remember I had nothing like that. When I worked in London, I worked at London Airport for the uh, air freight business. So this was quite different. Now, planning ahead, as I mentioned earlier, we'd, we'd call in the shops and, and put our orders in. So the fresh meat, bread, newspapers would come every week on the plane if you were lucky, fortnightly if it was delayed. But your bulk groceries had to come every two to three months on that little boat that we, that we had there. And therefore, you had to know what you were buying, what you needed. Now, remember, there's no, there was no real eggs, there was no fresh milk, there was no sort of fresh things. You couldn't just duck down to the local shop and if you'd run out of something, you had to remember to order bags of rice, tins and tins of beans or peas or everything came in cartons of 12 or 24 and you would stock them in your pantry. And even to this day, I, we still kind of buy in bulk and I always have a large pantry so I've got, I've got the stocks up so I'm, you know, I'm always used to doing that. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in here that have lived in, in some areas, particularly in Australia, that might be isolated and when you have floods and, and things like that happen, you do have to have those stocks and, and you know, in your pantry ready. And uh, you have to plan ahead, you have to buy in bulk. So that was a new, a new role for me. Now, the market was a, a bit of a challenge. You know, you're walking in and out of the local markets and I don't know if any of you went to the Rabal fruit and veggie market at all and saw the, the lines of people. In, in the markets that we had in those days, they were all sitting on the ground and you just walked along and you'd pick up your sweet potato or your cow cow. I didn't even know what a lot of those vegetables were, but they were the only vegetables there. They looked good, so I learned how to cook them. So the bananas were exceptionally beautiful and if you didn't buy any little yellow, little tiny, like ladyfinger bananas in Rabal, you missed out. They were so sweet, so beautiful. Um, and the pawpaws are growing all around you anyway, so you, you're lucky with that sort of thing. Um, as a 21-year-old, of course, I'm learning new handcrafts. When I arrived on this outstation, there was a group of women who had already established their craft group in one, one of the houses, and one of them was the art of quilting. So I sat for many days just stitching together little templates and making bedspreads and learning quilting. I learned all sorts of handcrafts like you know, macrame and stitching and anything, you name it, we did it. And at 21, I reckon I did all the embroidery, quilting, and all those things that you normally leave until you're retired. Now I'm retired, I'm looking for what I should have been doing when I was in my 20s. <laughs> so hence I'm on ships and I'm, I'm dancing every night. Well, I'm trying to, he doesn't, but yeah, he does. He's a good dancer, he's a good dancer. But the, I, did, I did so quite a lot and I used to make all my own clothes. And we would go to the the local shops in Medang, and you would just walk in and you would buy, you know, two yards and two yards of material. I'd just pick them, I'd just two yards of that one, that one, that one, that one, take them home, and then I would decide what I was gonna make with them. But you just bought them while you could. Now, collecting shells was a, a pastime of mine. You saw all the coral reefs around Bogia. We could walk out from our place onto the coral. You don't do that nowadays, but you walk along the coral, and I was picking up the shells. Beautiful, picking these shells up. You know, and in beaches in the UK, the shells you pick up are usually dead ones on the sand, and you take them home and you put them. These were alive. These shells were alive. I didn't know that the little cowrie shells, the baby ones at the bottom here, I had them on my hand and they all started moving <laughs> up my arms. And all these shells are you know, moving around. Luckily, I didn't pick up any of the really dangerous ones because the cat in Australia and Papua New Guinea, there are some dangerous ones. If you pick them up on the wrong end, you can get a bit of a sting. But I collected them, put them into the, the boiling water, cooked them up and then cleaned them and brought them all back. I've since shared them out with my two sons and, their gran and then my grandchildren with the story about where they came. And up the top in the basket, you'll see a, a shell that's uh, the white Kina shell. I'm actually wearing a necklace today that is cut out of one of these shells with the holy shillings set into them. Um, so that was one of the pride and joys. John managed to get a whole carton of those shells up in the Highlands, believe it or not, because they used them to trade with the people on the coast. And uh, so we collected lots of wonderful, wonderful shells. Now, as I said, there was no television. We had outdoor movies. And the reason I've got the Beatles on here is that 
the naivety of some, of some of us expatriate women, we'd be sitting on our canvas chairs in the outdoor movies, watching a, whatever movie was sent in from Port Mosby, and the local children would collect what they're called Christmas beetles. And I don't know if you've seen them. You, they, they can hook them together, and you, they used to hang them down the backs of the women while they were sitting watching the movies. And so you'd get up, and you'd all walk away with a string of beetles down your back. They didn't bite you or anything, but you thought, what? And then when they unlocked the legs, they just started crawling all over you. But the, the sound system we've got there, we, we, we upgraded from my record player of when I was 21, and on one of our leaves back, we bought this uh, sound system, which we still have today, by the way. It's 40-odd years old. And it, it, now vinyls are all back. We've got the big speakers, and we've got the twitters and woofers and whatever it is that makes the speakers sound absolutely fabulous. And uh, on top of all that, then we had to find games. Now, you know all the games that you would play, the Monopoly, anything and everything. But you've got to remember that there was no power at night time. So if you got really into a game of Monopoly or whatever it was, you'd have to get the, cal the Coleman lamp out, light up your gas lamps, hang them up, and play under those. And uh, that was, that was a, great, a great thing, especially if you were winning. You didn't want to give up. You know, we'd make our own rules up on many of the games made our own Christmas cards, did our own black and white photography in the end. We also had uh, vice versa parties. You know, we're stuck for entertainment up there. John, oh, the men would dress as the women and the women dressed with the men and we had a bit of a party. It was a bit of fun. They called them vice versa parties. I think they're happening all the time nowadays, but anyway. <laughs> back then, back in the 70s, it was a bit of fun. And progressive dinners. If you've ever done a progressive dinner, you know you go from house to house of entree, and by the time you get to the end, you've had way too many drinks, and you've got to try and find your way home. If you're doing that in an outstation in Papua New Guinea, there are no street lights, there's no paths, there's no roads, so you're kind of clambering down, we used to call them barracks, the ditches at the side of the, the sort of roads for the gutters for the water to go. So you clamber up and down these things to get from house to house. But, you know, that was, that was the way you, you entertained yourself. And if there was a visiting, you know, visitor coming in who happened to bring a guitar, we'd have a sing-along. We'd do, you know, oh, we loved our Irish, Irish sing-alongs are the best. Now, on to our second posting, is in Saido, was south of Madang. Now, a little story in, be in between. I am one of seven children, and I'm the youngest, and I'm the only girl. When we emigrated, I left, and my, I lost my dad when he was 18. I never found him again. No, <laughs> he passed away when I was 18. And I left my mum at home when we, when we emigrated, not realising what it was like, you know. Bye, mum. See you later. I know now. And so I used to write to mum, and I told her we were living in a beautiful tropical paradise of Bogia, and that if she was ever lonely, please feel free to join me. She was on the next ship out. <laughs> and John needs a medal for that, because she stayed with us then for 25 years. <laughs> with us with us <laughs> the whole time. So she arrived out in this side door, and there's mum, and she was uh, a granny to many, because there wasn't many old grannies around, and Lapun Mama, Pigeon English means a grey-haired older lady. So she was known as a Lapun Mama. She was well respected, she did never speak, she never spoke Pigeon English, she was very broad Scottish, she was about, about actually looks a bit like me now, <laughs> I think. Yeah, who said yes? <laughs> And yeah, everyone knows that, don't they? Yeah, you'll end up like your mother. That's what's worrying him. And uh, so, so she came, and the tropical paradise, paradise that I'd promised her was no longer. We ended up in Sidor. Sidor, as you saw from that earlier photograph, was an airstrip. There was three expatriate families. One, of the, one was the boss with his wife and two children, and the other one was um, a young couple from England. And they... Absolutely, when, when John went on patrol, the men went on patrol, his wife being English absolutely adored my mum because she'd recently lost her mum, so my mum became mum to a lot of other people. So she was well, well respected. The side door house, a little bit older, uh, a little bit more run down, more water tanks to look after. And again, you don't have running water, you didn't have taps. So this morning was nothing for us, not to... <laughs> not to have the water. We knew we could see bottles of water coming. We knew what we could do. Um, our water tanks, you'd have to run your hand down the side, and anyone's had water tanks in the outback of Australia or anywhere else, you'd know about it. You have to check the level of your water, and if you haven't, you get the, uh, in our case, the truck would come in from the river, 
and top up the water for you. And then you'd put kerosene on the top of it to stop the mosquitoes from breeding. So that's, that's just a little bit different from on the, where we were before. It had a little bit more rain up there. There's gas bottles. We, if we ran out of gas, we had to do exactly the same. You ta tap down the side of the gas bottles and make sure you had enough gas to keep you going for your cooking. And they'd have to be brought in on your ship, so you'd have to order them three months ahead. And the house below was a little bit, uh, not, as, not as good as the first house, but the furniture was exactly the same. Imagine my mother is living with us, and we're living in a house that does not have walls that go all the way up to the ceiling. We're a young couple. We wanted to start a family. My mother thought there was lots of earthquakes inside, or... <laughs> and we, we built ourselves a house wind, a bally hut, um, a, you know, a grass-roofed hut for entertaining, which was really, really interesting. And we have one of those in our townhouse in, in Brisbane, actually, and uh, we... <laughs> We didn't, we didn't pay $50, $50 for it. I think it was more like a few thousand dollars. But the, but the guys put it up for us. Now, there was a story John was talking about the Japanese War Graves Commission coming in and, and uh, spending some time with us. Well, they did. And I think he mentioned they brought their Johnny Walker and they had to share that every time they were having a little bit of a, a rem reminisce of losing their colleagues during the war. They'd get the Johnny Walker out. Now, my mother was a whiskey drinker. And so she'd join the Japanese in the Bally Hut. And the, the Johnny Walker bottle would get passed around, and my mum would, she was the consummate host. She brought the nibbles. She would bring out all the, the plate of cheese and biscuits or whatever we had. And then she'd join in with the dram. Every time it came around, she'd have a wee dram. So uh, that, that was interesting. She didn't speak Japanese either, but she got on really well with the, guy, <laughs> the guys that were there. She ran a guest house in Edinburgh. We ran a, a very large guest house up in Morningside in Edinburgh for... 10 years. Um, so she was used to dealing with people from all over the world. So, and she was able to cook meals for anybody and everybody. So she was a great help for me. But in 1973, we had self-government. And John was away on a patrol. And so mum and I had to step in and do some of the, the jobs, like turn up to the school, turn up for the choral festivals, look at the greasy pole, which is a popular pastime. You grease all the pole up with pig grease, put all the best prizes on the top of the thing, and tell them to go up and get them. You know, it was part of the fun. They, they did. They had fun. They enjoyed it. That was at pastimes, you know, things to do. You have all the hours in the day to spend. Now, pets. My pets. Now, John spoke about our dog, and I speak of him lovingly. So did he, but used to be the bane of his neck many times in chasing those pigs out. But he was one of the best little dogs, big dogs, that we ever had. Our local policeman decided when the patrol officer came on, he was very special. A key up in Papua New Guinea was a very special person to the locals. They, in fact, nowadays would like them to be back there helping them to re-establish a lot of the things that they've since lost over the years. But the policeman thought, I want to give the patrol officer a really nice dog. So he had he's sort of a, a Labrador boxer cross, but he was quite large. But at the time, he was given to us in a little cardboard box, little cardboard box. And because the policeman felt a bit nervous, the... Um, the dog had fleas, and they thought, we can't give the patrol officer a dog covered in fleas, so he shaved him. <laughs> Sh shaved the dog, gave him a wash, and brought him over, and he looked awful. And I'm going, yeah, have I got to take this? All right, okay. And he turned into be a beautiful, beautiful dog. And our houseboy actually got the, the little dog as well. He got a little dog as well. The owl on the right-hand side had fallen out of the tree or whatever, but John decided to pick it up and bring it home, and we sat and we fed it. This was called Eccles. Echoes the owl, and Pren was called Pren, it's pigeon English for friend. And the cat, well, we didn't call him anything, he was a pain in the what's it. But this, the, the owl, he, he, we had to teach him to fly, so John had to climb up the tree, and he'd launch, the, uh, <laughs> he'd launch it off the tree, and eventually, after a few falls, he, he, you know, John falling, not the owl, they, um, they got him in the, the air and away. Now, the, the crocodile that you saw at the beginning and in here, he's about what, six foot long, I suppose, totally stuffed. But he was given to John as a gift on one of his first patrols he was on. And the stuffing, was, the taxidermy was absolutely spectacular. It had one cut right down the middle, not a bone left in it, and it's all back together perfectly. Now, our son, our younger son, is a paleontologist, so he studies dinosaurs and what have you. But he also studied Komodo dragons. And he's fascinated with structures of animals, and he likes, see, he likes to do 3D imaging. 
So he decided to take the crocodile along to our local Green Slopes Hospital to the CT scanner, and he decided to put the crocodile through the CT scanner to check it out. There was no bones to be found, but the, CD images, the CT images that he got were really helpful for what he was doing. But can you imagine the faces of the patients sitting in the <laughs> waiting room, and in goes the crocodile. And he has done Komodo dragons in there as well, but he usually does those after hours. But he's at the Queensland Museum. The pussycat I rescued when he was going to be drowned because the plantation owners didn't need him anymore, didn't want any more cats around the place. And I picked him up and popped him in my pocket and took him home. Now, he couldn't see, so he ran around behind our feet, and I had, our feet, and I had little flip-flops on at the time. And he followed that noise, and anything that made that noise, he would attack it then, because he thought it was somebody coming to get him. And he'd jump up the side of the door to about this height, and then attack around the corner. He was really, he grew into be a monster. And he'd jump on the back of the dog's neck. He'd actually hang on and he'd, he'd run around the house and the dog would try to be, <laughs> get him off. But we hung on to him all the time. He became my mum's cat. He loved sitting in mum's room. But the locals thought he went, might make good tucker. He might be a good feed. He might fit in the pot well. So he disappeared down to the market many, many times. We had to go and rescue him and pay for him and bring him back. And then one time he, he disappeared, we never saw him again. So somebody must have, must have tasted like chicken, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no guinea pig, Sue. <laughs> it's a friend of ours. Anyway, um, the house boy and his wife, again, we had, we had the couple staying with us and they had their own baby and they helped to look after the house and... and uh, down, I put this picture in because of our, our ways of life. Like Christmas comes along and out comes the dead tree from out the back garden and you stick it inside in a pot and they're going, what? What do you do with a dead tree? Why are you bringing it indoors? You know, the local people say, these, these fellows, they're funny. And then you put lights on them and you switch the lights on and when you had power and these things start flashing. And they just stood in wonderment. They could not move when they saw our flashing Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of stories, lots of stories like that. And I think you've got to remember that we moved into a place where a lot of those local people were not used to having, you know, they're not used to having white fellows around, white people around, expatriates around. And working for them was something new for them, and they enjoyed it. They were getting paid for it. They were learning English, so it was helping them to move through their, their lives. Uh, I think in the, in the offices where we worked, the, they had employed a few of the, the local people there. But, you know, every, every 18 months, uh, every 21 months, we would get three months off. So we'd head off, and that was 21 months we'd work, or John would work, you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah, uh, 24 hours a day? Yeah, 24-7. 20, I was trying to think of the 24-7. 24, 24 hours, seven days a week. No breaks. You'd get called on to go on patrol. He would head off on patrol. And then you would, you know, just take it from there. And I just had to fit in and do whatever happened, you know, whatever we had to do. Now, the two outstations I've mentioned there, Bogia was a, a fairly large one. It was near Medang. Nowadays, there's a bit of a road from Medang up to Bogia. But if ever I went from Bogia into Medang, I used to stay at uh, the CWA, which is like the Women's Institute for the Brits on board. And the CWA used to look after us, and that was really, really great. And all those handcraft things that we did, Mum and I would set up um, stalls in the shops. We'd make lots of, um, I think hobby techs was a thing back then, hobby techs. We'd make little holly sprigs out of hobby techs and gel, all sorts of things we'd, we'd do. And we just passed the time of day. I just remembered another story. When we were inside or in that kitchen, John went off into Lai, I think it was, and he'd, he'd got a shopping list, and one of, on the shopping list was a... Uh, Pressure cooker. And you know what a pressure cooker is like. And the little bell at the top, the little thing at the top goes doo, 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 when it's cooked. So he brings this back and we start using it. And the pressure cooker, and I didn't put enough liquid in the first time. And it was one of the very old pressure cookers. And the, I think I was making something to do with pumpkin. And then it, the lid just pew, you know, blew off. So we had this. That's when you really need the house boy and the house girl to help you clean up. Um, <laughs> now, from when we were. Uh, inside, or John was told one day, he just came back off patrol, and he said, oh, okay, you're being posted, you're being moved, you've got to go up to the Southern Highlands. Okay, all right. 
No worries. Yeah, it's my job. I've got to go wherever you tell us. He didn't know where in the Southern Highlands. They hadn't got that far down the memo. They didn't have the where we're going. It just said Southern Highlands, which is up in the Highlands, in the middle of Papua New Guinea. And they basically said to us, right, we'll, we'll get a plane to come in and pick you and your family and all your gear, and we'll take you there. Well, along they come with a plane. That's the plane. But first of all, they tell you internal size of the plane, the dimensions of the plane. Then they tell you what weight you're allowed to take on the plane. And you don't have a removalist company that you can ring up to say, come in and pack all our gear up and take it to where we're going. We had to do it. And we had to make sure we didn't go past the weight that we were supposed to weigh. So we drew on the dining room floor a chalk mark of the internals of this plane. We got the bathroom scales out. John, we'd pack a box of your china. And remember, we took all our wedding presents with us, the china, the you know, cutlery and the ornaments and things that we had collected, and packed them up. And my mum, she brought her stuff with her too. And trunks, we had sea trunks that we bought in London before we left. We packed all these up, but you had to get on and off the scales, measuring the weight. And we'd write it all down to make sure we hadn't gone over the weight of the plane. And we just got it all worked out where it had to go. We numbered the numbers of boxes so that when they go in the plane, they go in the same way as we've put them on our floor. And the weight was okay. The adults, we had a houseboy, a house girl, mum, us, the cats, the dogs, everything. And then we decided we'd, flo- we, we'd pack it in the plane. And this is, this is just a quick sh- shot of us leaving. I remember these images in the 1970s. And when we left Sido, the plane came in to pick us up. We loaded up the the boxes into the plane with the houseboy and all the rest of us. That's flying into Sido. And those other houses you see there are actually the policemen's houses or the teachers' houses or whatever. And this is just to show you the terrain uh, that we we were flying over to get to where we're going. Again, it's a a 16 mil or 8 mil movie footage out the window of a, f- a plane. And we're flying up the, uh, the Ramu River, or in the valley, and then we'll get up into the highlands. So if you can remember the map of PNG, we were on the top right-hand side, and we're now flying into the middle, into a place called Garoka. Um, a few of you all have heard of Garoka. And we stopped there to refuel. So the plane came in, and we, got, we all got out and stretched our legs, take the dog for a walk. And it was when we were in Garoka that we went to the Tal Air office to let them know that we were moving on to Tarry, uh, to the Southern Highlands. And did they know where the flight was going next? And they were the ones that told us that we were going off to Tarry in the Southern Highlands. Uh, Tarry in the Southern Highlands was a much, much larger outstation. It was more of a, a, I don't know, it was not an outstation. Yeah, I'll try and remember the name in a second. But the, this is all through the valleys, and then we got into the mountains, and these are the mountains in Tarry, and this is us flying into Tarry. And this will show you the airstrip and the size of this outstation. It was a district office, I suppose, in a way. Uh, it had a hospital, a little bit bigger than the one in, in Medang. Now, I'll just, I'll just hold that there, because I'm, I'm doing well on time, because I, I rushed through fairly quickly at the beginning. But it's just to show you our life, our life stories up in Papua New Guinea there. And it's not like it's happening right now. It's something that happened back in the 70s. But what it's done for us is, is made us aware that, you know, we, we can handle all sorts of situations. And tomorrow I will be talking about um, living in isolation continued, but it'll be up in the Southern Highlands. But then I will go on to, because we always get asked, what next? What did you do after Papua New Guinea? And so I have put in, and this is the first time, so you're the audience that's going to be my guinea pigs. I'm going to test you. I've added a bit at the end of the tomorrow's presentation to show you what we did, what we got up to in the Northern Territory of Australia, because we then worked with the indigenous people in the Northern Territory, and we brought the influences of our Scottish background, our Papua New Guinea experience, and the Aboriginal connections that we made in the Northern Territory. So that'll all be cobbled together for you in a presentation tomorrow. But I think it's, it's, it's been fun for us, and we've, we've kept in touch with a lot of the Papua New Guinean folks that we knew. 
for a while, we, we, we didn't see many because once you fly in, many people say to us, oh, do you know so-and-so up there? Or do you, have you seen this particular place? And we go, no, once we got posted to an outstation, that's where we stayed. We very rarely got out. Um, and tomorrow you'll see a very isolated outstation that John was the officer in charge at. And uh, I'll fill you in a bit more on, on that one. But I think uh, that's basically what that says. It's, that's, and, and I've put, our I don't know if you can even read that at the bottom. Our first son, and you'll see that tomorrow, was born in Papua New Guinea. And he now lives in the States, in Phoenix, Arizona. And the younger boys, uh, I, say, I call them boys, they're in their 40s. But uh, I was the same when, when I left, you know, when I saw mum in my 40s. Now, that's for me. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. They've been following us from we went. Yeah, yeah. So where the hell were you when That's we wanted right. to see? Oh, they're more out there. Would the oh, cross the resemble the anything to see on the rock there? Yours? No. Not because of the Christian set on there. Uh, well, I saw it on the other as side. As we go there, it's a Catholic mission just to yeah. round the corner there. It's probably a boat went off up there. Uh, this is a known bay, the Alatau, and we went between our houses. Uh, so you can imagine it was just a walk across the backyard to his house and yeah, bring it man. Yeah, you can have people still talking about it.
Here we are inside the middle of the caldera. A former volcano in the um, Vituar, it's the first time this ship's been in. Here's the entrance to the caldera there. He's come in and he's just doing a bit of a pirouette at the moment going from going in a clockwise direction turn around and go back out you can see right in there there's some people in their canoes he's just sounded his horn a few times to let everybody know we're here as if they wouldn't know that we were here a uh, ship this size coming in here is probably the biggest that's ever been in here there's a Village over there. Yeah, He's talking about the missionary that was his dead. There's no white fellas on the island anymore. All right. So who looks after the mission then? Oh, no, the missionary. 